Found Granberry wound up sitting right where it does. And if you, if you read our Facebook ads, you saw that it's, it, it involves, it's kind of like today's headlines, it involves money, power, politics, scandal, fortunately no sex that we know of. So we're not going to have to do that. But what I'm going to do, I want this to be kind of like since we've got a fairly small group, and we are going to have questions and answer at the end. But interrupt me, you know, if there's any questions that we're, you know, won't, won't be a problem, just raise your hand and we'll try to answer any questions. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to give you like a 30,000 foot overview of what happened. You know, how the events, of how the town site was selected. And then I'm going to tell you about the Landers and the Nut families. Like, I'm, the eight Landers, your first county judge, and some of the judges, you have yeah. an autograph picture of uh, I would, he was my great, great, great grandfather, hence, he would be my daughter's four, he would be her fifth. And you said he was the first county judge? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma Looks like Elf. Really yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I thought. Like okay. I said, okay. or a new rag or whatever. But it is, a, if you zoom in, I have the original, or not an original, but a scan of the photo. And if you zoom in, he's got an injury coming up here on his cheek by his right eye. So we think that's really a man. Um, but anyway, we're, gonna, we're just going to have an overview. I'm going to tell you again about the Landers, the Nuts, kind of those two families. And I'm not going to get into real detail. Of, about that, we've got another expert, uh, Melinda Ray here, and she's going to do another one of these talks uh, in the future and get it. She knows a lot more about my family than I do, I promise you. Uh, but then I'm just going to sort of tell you my personal story and kind of how I came to be aware of this and how I'm connected to the Landers and the um, So, Hood County was formed in 1866 by the Texas Legislature. They took most of the land from Johnson County and a small part of Erath, and in its original form, it included all of what's now Hood, and you know, some of them, it included all of current Hood, plus what's now Somerville in its original form. Um, the first requirement was to elect the county officials, to hold an election, elect the county officials, which they did, and eight landers uh, was elected the first county judge. We have actually upstairs we have a reproduction of the election tabulation from that very first election. Um, oh, the other thing we're going to do, kind of when I get through uh, uh, telling you about the Landers and that family, we're actually the last two pages in your handout that the PAA got highlighted. We're going we're gonna to go over these passages from the Hood County History by Thomas Ewell. I call it the, uh, it's the Bible, the Gospel of Ewell, the study of Hood County History. So we're going to read over those passages, or we're just going to kind of unpack those a little bit and see what you will have to say about all this. So the county's form, they elect their officials, A. Landers is the county judge, and the next task is they're supposed to select a site uh, for the county seat, for the place to put the courthouse. And it's supposed to be within five miles of the geographic center of the county. Because <clears throat> obviously travel was difficult and dangerous in those days. They Comanches were still raiding. So travel was a big deal and it was supposed to be located within five miles of the center. So anyway, all of a sudden people start jumping up wanting to donate land for the new town. Uh, there was a site at Acton, uh, someone at Acton wanting to donate land, or someone at Thor Springs, someone uh, the, well, if y'all know where the Peninsula development is, that was called Stockton at the time. And that's technically, that's the site of where Granbury was before it is now. It was in the development of the Peninsula, or right in the area. Oh, and then uh, another site was called the Center, and it was west of Comanche Peak somewhere. And it was technically probably truly closer to the geographic center. I don't really know exactly where it just says west of Convention Peak. And then there was another site, uh, with Andy Walter's place, I believe it was, which would be somewhere around Indian Harbor, somewhere down there. Again, that would probably be closer to the geographic center. Include several. So when you hear this, that all these people want to donate their land, you know, you think, wow, these are really, you know, nice people want to give away their land. Well, they I'm sure they were nice people. But the game, it was really a real estate It was, uh, you donate, you own a tract of land, you donate a piece in the middle of your land. 
Oh, and of course, the land, uh, the Lambert Nutton site where the Grammar sits, that was one of the community sites. But the game was you, you donate a piece of land in the middle of a larger piece of land, and as the town grows, your property becomes more money. So I know, you know, personally, you know, when I started kind of reading about this, I didn't tend, you know, I'm thinking of these people on the frontier, you know, living hand to mouth and farming and ranching and fighting the Indians, and you don't tend to think of them as real estate speculators, <laughs> but they were. And so, anyway, so what they did, so they had an election, and the site that was selected uh, during that first election was the center, the location was the center. And again, we'll read in more detail about that. I can't remember all the details, but we'll read about it in you there. So they had the, uh, the county officials convene, uh, you know, to declare the results of the election. And before they could do that, they landed to the German court and said, no, it's not okay. You know, he just turned court and said, no, not gonna. So that election just went by the wayside. So they had two more elections. And this is basically the same thing happened. Abe Landers just arbitrarily says no. And he, the deal was, okay, the Nutt brothers, Jesse and Jake Nutt, and Tommy Lambert, uh, Lam Tommy Lambert, this creek back here is known as Lambert Branch, and Tommy Lambert was another early settler, and he owned land kind of to the north and east of Granbury, the Nuts owned kind of west and south of but it turns out that Jesse and Jake Nutt were Abe Landers' nephews. And not only was Jesse his nephew, but he was also his son-in-law because uh, Jesse Nutt was married to Abe Landers' daughter, who was his first cousin. So nevertheless, that once you kind of get hit to that, it <laughs> starts start making sense. So anyway, Abe threw out all these elections. And uh, people started getting upset, rightfully so, what would they? And so Abe says, okay, what we're gonna do, we're gonna call in impartial commissioners from surrounding counties to, to make this decision. And of course, Abe, I guess, was instrumental in, in getting the, pick, they picked the commissioner from Johnson, Erath, and Bosque. And guess which side these commissioners picked? Yeah, we're going to it which is what I wanted to do. So that's kind of, you know, that's the 30,000 foot view. That's what happened. It turns out that's a good site to put it down. And, uh, you know, the, the reasons they cited for neglect or rejecting some of the other locations were a lack of water. There's one in the center, which I, I don't think there are any creeks or water sources. So, you know, it's a pretty valid reason for doing that. But the real reason is, is because, uh, Abe Landers wanted um, one of his nephews and son-in-law to prosper. And whatever, however they prospered, whatever money they made from selling all that land, apparently it got frittered away before it got to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have to deed the two cemetery lots or something. Or so now, now that you kind of have the 30,000 foot view, I'm just going to tell you about the Landers and the Nut families. Again, this is a, just a broad sweep overview and, and then uh, we'll go into more depth in another visit. But the Landers and Nutt families were connected um, going back to the late uh, 1700s in North Carolina. Then they, they, they kind of followed the westward migration and you know each time they hopped to a new spot some family members some stay and some, uh, some moved on. So they go from North Carolina Kentucky, correct me if I'm wrong, but then Bedford County, Tennessee, and, or, yeah. North Carolina is Tennessee. North Carolina, yeah, there, Kentucky's in there briefly somewhere, because yeah. I think they gave it for Yeah, I'm glad. Yeah. And Bedford County, Tennessee, and then the Osho, oh, Southwest Missouri, Newton County, Missouri, and uh, from Newton County, then some of the family members started moving here to Texas, to the frontier in the mid-1850s, mid to late 1850s. Now, Abe Landers, again, the guy on the front there, his sister, uh, Sarah, Ann, Sarah Ann Landers, she married David Nutt. Uh, David Nutt, who this whole, David Lee Nutt, his son, built this house. And Jesse and Jake were his, uh, were his sons also. They had the building, the Nutt House building on the square. 
so anyway, these two families are closely connected, and uh, the Landers, uh, and his, Landers and his wife, his wife had whatever ten or eight kids, and David Knight and his wife have likewise, as was the case back then, they had nine or ten children. Well, it turns out like four these kids are all first cousins, and it turns out that four sets of them get married. So there's a lot of interrelatedness now. Now I'll tell you kind of the personal side of the story. So you know, when I, I grew up in Granbury uh, and went to Tarleton, graduated Tarleton, and moved away for 20 some odd years, and I've uh, been back for about 20 some odd years. I live in Dave Cordova, uh, but nevertheless. At some point when I was in, and I didn't really care about history like most kids back then. I mean, you know, my mom and grandmother would try to tell me a little bit, and I would go, that's great, you know, what's for something before we go? Yeah. <laughs> but I, at some point when I was maybe, uh, you know, junior, senior in high school, it, uh, it dawned on me that, that both of my grandmothers, my father's mother, Sarah Sue Landers was her name, and she married my grandfather, who was Cody. And, and my mother's mother was Maddie Landers, and she married Bob Mangold, and they had the Mangold Toy Factory, so that was my But anyway, at some point it dawned on me that both my grandmothers had the same maiden name, you know. And when you're in high school, it was like, they thought, well, oh, this is kind of odd, but okay. And, you know, I asked my parents, I said, so, like, are y'all related or something? <laughs> and this was before computer genealogy, and they said, yeah, way back there somewhere. And sure enough, they, they didn't know how. But in, in later years, it, my grandmother on my mother's side, Maddie Mango, she gave me a, I don't know if bring it with me, it's, uh, it would be like an edition of Mule's History of the County that was published in the 50s, I guess, in the early 50s. And I guess she, she knew at some point somebody would get interested in who all these people were. So she had made notes uh, in the margin. You know, she would say, this is your great-great-grandfather, this is your great-great-great-grand, you know, she had made all these notes. And so my uh, my dad passed away when he was like 60 years old, and my mom died suddenly when she was 68. But up uh, until then, I, you know, I thought, well, that's somebody else's job to keep up with all this family history like everybody else does. So um, when my brother and I were, you know, kind of going through the house and cleaning things out, we came upon uh, all the old family pictures. And, you know, I asked my brother, I said, do you want these? He goes, no, I don't want them. I said, well, I don't either, but we, we shouldn't throw them away. So we like, I said, let's flip the coin. Whoever loses has to take it. <laughs> so I lost. And I lost. So I had these boxes. I took them home. I was looking for work. I stacked them up in the garage. And at some point, uh, at some point, I thought, well, you know, I guess it's my turn to figure out all this stuff. So. So I did get, you know, all the material out and kind of start reading through it. And that's when I was, I was reading the story about the, uh, the selection of the town site of Granbury. And I thought, you know, but, and then as I put together the people and how they fit together, then I went, oh, this makes sense. You know, this was a money deal. It was a real estate deal. But, you know, the brochure, some of the little tourist brochures you pick up around town, you know, they'll, they'll say, Oh, the land for the town of Granbury was donated by Tommy Lambert and Jesse and Jake Nutt. And that just stops there. And you go, oh, these guys are real nice. You know? And they were. But at the end of the day, it was about money. And, uh, and uh, those folks were pretty savvy developers. Uh, I guess now, let's just kind of, any questions up to this point? Any comments? Where, where did they serve until the courthouse was built? Well, now, um, and Melinda, you feel free to jump in. Okay, uh, out at the, the community of Stockton, but you know, when all this is going on, the community of Stockton, which is out where uh, the peninsula is, they held court. I don't know if they might have a courthouse, I'm sure it's just somebody's barn or cabin. And if, if you read Ewell's history of Hood County, Abe Landers was, uh, he was pretty much a character and he was known to, you know, adjourn court. Or he would adjourn court, and they would regather in the saloon. There was a saloon. <laughs> and uh, in fact, uh, I will let me, let me tell this quick story about a 
uh, just so you'll have a little more of his background. When he was in Missouri, um, in Newton County, Missouri, there, there's a mill, like a grist mill or whatever, it's called uh, Jolly, now it's called Jolly Mill, I don't know what it's called right there. But the name Jolly Mill came from the word jollification, and Abe Landers is given credit for coming up with that name because when uh, on Saturdays when the local farmers would bring their grain and stuff to be ground, a, uh, would, he would furnish a jug of whiskey and they would have fist fights for entertainment. So he was, in fact, I told Andy Rash when he was kind of judge, I said, Andy, you know, you need to keep that tradition. Buy <laughs> <laughs> a jug of whiskey and let's have fist fights on the square. <laughs> and he would draw a crowd. So, okay, let's just kind of unpack what Ewell has to say, and then we'll, we'll uh, do some more questions. Okay, and I've highlighted, obviously, you're going to take these home, you're free to read all you want. I, was just, I just sort of highlighted the, what I consider the most relevant parts. So, we'll start with that first paragraph. Grand Mary, christened by the legislature, is the county site, was yet, however, an uncertain identity. There were several places within the prescribed limits that aspired to the honor of bearing the name of that distinguished general. Evidently, not so much because of the honor as from the desire of the owners of the several sites offered to gather the material advantages to be derived from being the county town. So right there, Yule tells us it's money. Now, you know, again, he writes in a different style, and if you read that without knowing, you know, you go, well, what's he talking You know what I mean. But, once you put the piece of the puzzle together, you realize, oh, I see the material advantages for the money. Uh, then, he, you know, the next paragraph talks about, about the uh, county being born. Um, okay, this constitution provided for the election of the usual county officers with a tenure of four years. And from the most reliable sources of information, the following men were elected in our first election. A. Landers County Judge, A.J. Wright, Sheriff. Now, A.J. Wright, that's A.J. Wright's picture hanging right there uh, on the wall. And A.J. Wright's wife was was a sister of the nut. So Abe had a connection to him, too. Abe, uh, his wife was Elizabeth Nutt. All right. Okay. Um, Alex McCamma was clerk of the county uh, court. John Morris, district court. Oh, Peter Garland, treasurer. Okay, Peter Garland. And that, he's going to be a good topic for another visit like this at some point. Okay, uh, David Lee Nutt uh, built this house. His wife, Sue Garland, uh, her maiden name is Garland. She was Peter Garland's daughter. Her big daughter right there. And Peter Garland, he was uh, he was involved, I won't get into it a bunch, but he was involved <laughs> in an Indian a massacre, basically, up in Palatina County. He was a well-known Indian fighter, and it, it involved uh, the Texas Rangers and Rip Ford, Rip Ford, R.I.P. Ford, they called him, and the governor of Texas, it was a big deal. <coughs> anyway, so Peter Garland was the treasurer. Uh, Gideon Mills, assessor, went for Texas. Okay. Uh, soon an election was held for the, okay, they was talking about, you know, the next responsibility of locating the county site. <coughs> Okay, so soon an election for that purpose was ordered. And the several places which stood as candidates were the center, that's the one I was telling you about west of Comanche Peak, understood to be just west and near Comanche Peak. North Springs, Stockton, Lambert's Branch, and the site offered by Andy Walters at its place on the river east of Comanche Peak. At the first election, the center was carried by a large majority, with the result of this election being unsatisfactory to those in power and influence, was for some reason not officially declared. And it is said that when the commissioner's court presided over by Judge Landers met for the purpose of ascertaining and declaring the result, the final act was averted by a preemptive order from him adjoining the court. So that's what that's what I was telling you about. He just said, no thanks. <coughs> We're not going to do that. Um, I'm not going to read that whole next paragraph, just highlight, the part that I've highlighted. He said, of many other men of influence and true capacity in favor of the Lambert branch, uh, 
where Tom, uh, or where Thomas Lambert and Jay have done, had offered a donation of 40 acres to the town site. Oh, a scheme was proposed and carried into execution, evidently by the friends and promoters of the Lambert side, whereby Judge Landers named three commissioners of our sister counties, Johnson, E. Rabbit County, and Toski, to meet in Hood County and examine into the merits of the contesting points and decide between them. This commission consisted of whatever, Colonel Blackberry, Mosque, Isaac County, Ralph, William Burke, and Johnson. Oh, and see, he says, this extraordinary commission in no manner known to law. In other words, this is not my, this isn't my how you're supposed to do it. Um, after meeting and considering the matter, made up a decision by a vote of two to one in favor of the Lambert Nut Commission. <coughs> so, that's, that's what happened. Uh, flip to that next phase. Um, okay, again, I, mean, I encourage you when you get home, read the whole thing and make a little more sense. I'm just trying to hit the highlights here. This long contest was not only animated, but in some measure became acrimonious, engendering bitter feelings between some good citizens that had its subsistence only when they were no more. In other words, these people stayed mad until they died, I guess. Whatever may have been the methods altogether employed for the attainment of the result, and, and however long afterwards a controversial spirit of discontent remained with some, yet time and other circumstances seemed long, seemed long since to have established beyond question the wisdom and stability of the selection of the Lambert and Nut Foundation as the site of the country. So, um, you know, and you, you kind of have to imagine Ewell was writing this, I guess, in the late 1800s, and, uh, or, uh, and you know, a lot of these. A lot of, you know, Abraham's children were still alive, and a lot of, so he's kind of having to tread a little cautiously on what he says, and that's why, you know, I think he might not go into even more detail than what he does, but, but he spells it out there. There's absolutely no doubt that Abraham was kind of in cahoots with his uh, nephews and his son-in-law uh, to, to, you know, so to get this side selected as the town side so that when the town grew, uh, they would prosper. So, questions, comments, observations? The proximity to the river then, so people could travel. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the other sites that were contending, I don't know exactly where all of those were, but it's, uh, you know, it turns out that, you know, obviously water back then big deal because I mean that they could dig wells I guess back you know rock line wells back then but it was difficult and there's there are a number of springs like that come out of the Blundwell Doyle Springs Road where I grew up I was right down there on 144 Market Street there's like a couple of streams that come out of freshwater streams and then there was another one back behind plantation in there were streams along the bluff that were good freshwater sources and in fact that's why i grew up uh, hunting areas also along the bluffs on the brazos but the brazos is too salty to be good drinking water and that's why the native americans uh, chose to have their camps any along the brazos anywhere there, there there had to be a junction of a creek or a stream or a stream come out of the bluff. But anyway, the same held true with the settlers. They needed a good, you know, freshwater source. So ultimately, you know, it is a good sign, you know. And now the others may have had good water sources up too. Now the one known as the center, that's what those commissioners uh, said was their reason for not taking it, was because of the lack of water. But, you know, be that is the thing. Anybody else? Any we, yeah. we have water if anybody would like to. Yeah, speaking of water. Anybody else? 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 Anybody one of the forks of the brass is, is known as the salt river out in West Texas. Uh, it picks up salt from the soil. And again, like some of the other creeks around here, like the Lexi and the Leon River, the Leon is, uh, 
y'all didn't realize, but maybe we may sign some of y'all up. We got your name and email address. Not really. You'll have to have to follow. But um, anyway, this would have been in the fall of 2019. I know it wasn't last fall because we were closed and covered all that. So in the fall of 2019, and I was working here as my day at work. And it was a, it was in the fall. It was a cold, rainy day, and uh, I had brought some paperwork, you know, things to read. But I was done with that by about two, two thirty, and so I was like dying of boredom. And so I thought, you know, I'll just post something on Facebook and say, uh, hey, I'm down here at the History Center. Come down and see me, and I'll tell you a story about local history. And I thought, no, by the time I do that, by the time somebody gets down here, I'll be gone anyway. But, but it, you know, the idea was kind of planted. That, well, maybe if we did something other than just unlock the door, you know, we'd have to come. And I promise you, I haven't been bored today. And I hope I didn't bore you all. If, if, if I did, we'll give you a full refund of your ticket price, which I believe is zero dollars. So, uh, but now we want, we're, we're, we're planning on doing this monthly, and we've got a real good line of speakers. Now, the only thing we're struggling with is our space, as you can see. This is, that's, why, that's why we did what we did with the ticket deal is we said we got 20 chairs. <laughs> we can't have anybody else. But we're also looking at possibly um, getting access to the church across the street so we can have a crowd of 50 or 100 or anything like that. So what are y'all's thoughts? Do y'all like this type of thing? Yes. 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 You just teased us. Yeah, yeah. we did. I, well, I was a guinea pig, so it's only going to get better from here. I promise you. I promise Does the you. library, does their area hold that many people? Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't I, I've been to the library, of course, but I don't know that they have how much seating capacity. Well, it's between the old library and the new library, there's yeah. a great big room. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. I don't worry about that. I didn't know that. Celebration Hall. Celebration. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Celebration yeah. Hall is. And here's the other thing. I mean, you know, some of you, I'm sure, are aware of some of you may not be. But we uh, conduct uh, once or twice a year. Now, again, we got interrupted with COVID. But um, we have what we call the Randy McAtee Lecture Series. And that's where we have bringing speakers, uh, well-known speakers from around Texas. So yeah. yeah. raise your hand if you've been to any of those. Anybody been to the Randy McAtee Series? Okay. Y'all need to really, uh, <coughs> pardon? Where? Well, we either uh, Granbury Live or the Opera House. Now, uh, in November, we're going to have a play going to put on a play, and it's about the formation of the opera house, about Mary Lou Watkins, you know, Mary Lou ringing the dinner bell, and the restaurant square, yeah, I'm going to, oh, September, correct, okay, wait, when is, when is, okay. there's Harrigan, and there's, uh, and there's opera house, I get it, and this is Teresa Sam, she's on the board, and she's the smartest person I know, she's not the smartest person I know, but, uh, we're doing a play at the opera house about, the restoration of the Opera House. Because when Cody and I graduated from high school in Granbury, the Opera House was uh, a tomb. I mean, it hole in the roof and dirt on the floor and everything lived in there. It was a mess. And so it didn't always look like this. And uh, so it's an awfully wonderful story about how the Opera House was restored and the people came together and did it. There was no government money in it. It was just a wonderful story. So that will be the last Sunday night in September, I think it's the 26th or something, yeah. and the first yeah. two Sunday nights in October, yeah. like the 3rd and the 10th or something, and it's at 7 o'clock, and you'll be able to get tickets for that through the regular Opera House ticket mode. So so that's September, October, October, and then what Cody was talking yeah, about Harrigan. is uh, Stephen Harrigan uh, was an author in a, news, a magazine many times and he wrote this big book it's about this big you know it's like this and it, it's called the big wonderful thing and it's the story of texas history from when god created the earth i mean it's so inclusive it's just a wonderful story and stephen is coming on thursday november the third and uh doing a report no, see, it takes all of us. <laughs> November the 4th, Thursday. 
Uh, and so we're going to do that at Redbird Live. And then after he reviews his book, we'll have a book signing and the wine and cheese thing. And then uh, Saturday and Sunday right after that, November 6th and 7th, will be the Redbird's 150th birthday party celebration. Uh, sesquicentennial, and it'll be right across the street at Langton Square. So, Cody mentioned about uh, Friends of the Bridge Street History Center, and it is a membership uh, organization that's got some small dues, but it does help support uh, the History Center. And uh, from that group of people is where we, uh, we have opportunities to be docents or, in, you know, whatever things we've got going on. We do a lot of stuff outside the walls of History Center, even though our mission statement is to collect, preserve, and interpret the life stories of the people of Gregory and Hood County and to examine how they illuminate the history of America. That doesn't mean that it has to start in this in this room, in these rooms. I mean, we do have some artifacts, but we're a storytelling museum. So, I mean, we had a Civil War symposium a few years ago, and uh, we, we took a bunch of people well, it was just the friends that got to do this. Uh, Elizabeth Crockett's land that she inherited because David died in the Alamo is out at uh, John and Becky Brumley's property. And it's their private property. They own all of the land that Elizabeth inherited. Mm -hmm. And so they allowed the, us to bring the friends out there and have a wine and cheese party and to crawl all over the buildings and go down to the Baptist one at the creek and see the school spot and it was just, you know, an honor to get to be able to do that. But that was just for the prince. So they ate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, so we do a lot of things for that. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you to do when you leave is uh, right to the this side of the front door is our guest book. And uh, if you'll just put your name, you don't have to do any other, you know, identifying information. We just like to see how many do paint and stuff like that. So please sign the guest book. And does anybody want a friend's application? Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you. What do you think? Uh, it's an application uh, for yeah, becoming yeah, a friend of the Great Street History Center. Acclaimed historian. Uh, well, she knows all of the buildings around Green at uh, the local mails by local folks. So I'm going to let her give you just a, a brief summary of what she's going to do. It, it, next month. I want to give a teaser for the oh, next one in case you want to come back. <laughs> what, I, what I'm going to call it, I think, see what you all think, is um, a special sense of place. What led about the building of Green the building of Grand Barry, the way we know it now, the people and the culture that led to this special charm that we all love. So that's what I'm going to talk about. The, the way the square looks now, what led to that, the buildings that are there, what led to the buildings that are here today. And then, um, I don't know if Melinda wants to talk about the follow-up in September. I'm going to be following Mary, and uh, we're going to backtrack a little bit because between A and what Mary's going to be talking about, there was the great Granberry land dispute. And basically, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is what, what caused Granberry to be about 10 years later in developing those wonderful buildings we have because of this big blah blah that happened uh, and uh, we're, we're gonna you know we're gonna talk about uh, basically how it all came to happen from the time that A was county judge moving forward for about the next 15 years and um, it, it covers you know the beginnings of the town of Granbury and the establishment of the square and how what happened so, um, the best we'll be doing uh, in September. So, I'll see a lot of you there. Okay, we 
we've taken about 45 minutes, which is kind of what we were planning on, unless there are more questions or observations. Yeah. I have many questions. Fire away. Uh, when we first moved here back in 83, the St. Helen building, I literally had to shop for books in there with a flashlight because there was like two single bulbs uh, hanging. Okay. And an old woman, I mean, she was old woman, Claire, who lived down across from the, the library, uh -huh. yeah. and had cats. Yep. Claire. Uh, yeah. yeah, that was so unique. I just yeah. loved it. Yeah. Uh, I found a book I'd been searching for, Magnificent Obsession. Well, what was her last name? Claire. Uh, uh, her son had a GTO in the front yard. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you where she lives, but I can't tell you where. What her last name? What? I can't remember what, her last name, but she was there for years. What building was it in? Uh, St. She lived over next to Terry McNew. Nope. Yes. Well, I'll tell you one last story, personal, you know, since we're talking about old time grand jury. <clears throat> when I was, I guess this would have been in the mid-60s, when I was in my teen years, and well, it was kind of when skateboards were invented, but you couldn't really buy one, you had to make them. So my buddies and I, we would take roller skates, steel wheel roller skates, and bolt them to a board. Did the same thing. Did you? Yeah. And you know what happens, like if you hit a pebble or a rock, it like stops. So we figured out that the hallway at the courthouse was linoleum tile. So on Sundays, we would go down to the courthouse, and I don't know if you look down at ground level, there's these little windows, and a couple of them were missing the grades on them. So we would, we would crawl down into the basement of the courthouse, we would come up through the trap door under, and we would uh, do our skateboards up and down the hall of the courthouse, and people would see us coming and going, crawling into the courthouse, and they'd wave. <laughs> 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 Don't you kids break into the courthouse? Yes, uh, one on the, go on. if you're not free. Uh, no. But I was gonna share a yeah. story about the courthouse also. Oh, sure. I grew up in Granberry. And um, when I was growing up, we would come to town on Saturdays and go to the Palace Theater. And sometimes afterwards or before, we'd, to kill time, we'd go play at the courthouse. Oh, yeah. And about when they restored the courthouse a few years back, however many years it's been, yeah. 10 maybe, something like that, they restored it, went in and you know, replastered all the walls and everything. They took all the plaster off of the walls upstairs and there were names on the courthouse wall. As it turned out, it was four of us classmates. Oh my and they contacted us, the person that uh, worked, one of the persons that worked in the county. It was myself, Glenda Smith, I don't know if any of you know her, Jill Thompson, and uh, What's your name? Barbara Lewis used okay. to be. I graduated in 59 from Granberry High School. Okay. But anyway, it was so unique. And I have pictures. I did. I should have brought them. Oh, but okay. I have pictures. We went up there. The four of us went up there and took pictures of our, you know, standing down with the, by the signatures. Yeah. And they never did catch us. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, it, did they leave it uncovered? No. Oh, that would have been unique. No, no <laughs> they did just pictures. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. We took pictures. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the other thing, real quickly, yeah. oh, okay. I was going to share. Uh, I lived in this house. In this, in this house. Oh, really? When I was nine and ten years old. What, what was this? What was this? Oh. It was. Uh, I. We left. My family. We rented it, and we lived in the entire downstairs, and a family lived upstairs, huh. and uh, we lived there about probably a year. We just rented it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I haven't been back since I've been back in Granbury 20 years ago. I have not. This is the first time I've been back oh, to see cool. the inside. Yeah, the front room is from Yeah, the front room is from Granbury. You know, my mother, the Van Gogh's, uh, yeah. lived here. And I don't even know the years. It, it would have been late 30s, 40s. Yeah. But so they were here for two. Yeah, Bob, uh -huh. Van Gogh, and my grandmother, yeah. Maddie. Do you have an original stick horse? Yeah, I was going to ask you know, was it the no, mine Aww. was at the Hood County years ago. I didn't. I didn't have any, and uh, my aunt uh, had one and gave it to me. 
and it's now at the Hood County, the, the Hood County Museum. I don't know that. Right. Now, Jake Fairway has several original Van Gogh toy companies. They featured oh, that not too long ago. In, I'd say not too long ago. It's probably years. Paper. They had a big article about that. Yeah. The first page article about the stick horses. Right. Well, yeah. yeah, and actually, uh, I'll tell this one last thing <laughs> here. I'm really going to do it. <laughs> So, since we're on the topic of the Bengal Stick Horse Factory, if you go to YouTube and go, and go to YouTube and search for Bengal Toy Factory, there's a video, uh, or it's a video, it was originally a film, and you'll see right at the start, you'll see like a cute little blonde headed boy, who would have been me, <laughs> and, Tariq, and Jay Carraway, who's on our board. I'm not the cowboy cow. Yeah, Jake's got the cowboy head on, and Teresa, uh, uh, who spoke to you a minute ago, Teresa Sims. She was in do what? I was supposed to be Yeah, she was. But uh, here's a quick start, make it quick. So I didn't even know that existed. I must have been five or something when they filmed that. But years ago, probably 15 or 20 years ago or something, they were, somebody was writing a story at the County News about a toy factory, and they just contacted me and you know wanted to know what I had. I said I just got some pictures, you know, family pictures and a little memorabilia. But this was again kind of, you know, as as folks were starting to use the internet and email. So I uh, Googled it, Mango Toy Factory, and something popped up about it said Southwest Collection at Texas Tech. So I reached out to them. Uh, you know, I had to talk to like five people before anybody knew what I was talking about. And finally, you know, I, I got hold of the guy that was in charge, and I said, hey, I, I thought it was like a magazine article. You know, I, I didn't know what it was. Did you, oh, it said Steve's for Small Fry. Mango Toy Factory. So anyway, I finally got hold of the guy, and uh, I said, hey, I'd like you to copy that article. You know, my grandparents and all Toy Factory and all that. He said, oh, no, it's not a, uh, it's just not a, an article, it's a film. It was, uh, apparently, I think it was Mobile Oil, one of the big oil companies. Is that one of the mm -hmm. series on small business? Yeah, they they went around. It's kind of it kind of reminds you that Texas country reporter type deal. But anyway, so I, you know, I said, oh, I paid him to put it on. I guess then it was videotape, and I've since had it converted to digital uh, wow. media, and I uploaded it to YouTube. But but it's pretty interesting. It, it shows how they made the stick horses. And, uh, so anyway, that's it. So it's on, on YouTube? Yeah. Is that yeah. Yeah. Mangle? Not good. Well, you can Google it, but if you go to YouTube, you can search directly on YouTube for Mangle Toy Factory. I mean, it, it has quite a few employees at one time. Yeah, I think it's about, no, it was like, in fact, in that video, I think it tells, I mean, they employed like, at one time, I think it was the biggest employer in the county of the major school, but, and if you, if you look closely at the very end of the video, there's a case of, I guess, stick horses, and it's got, they, they zoom in on the label, and on the label it says, Sears, Roebuck, and Company, Lima, Peru. That's the only address on Sears, Roebuck, Lima, Peru. So I guess to ship stick horses to Lima, Peru, you just put Sears, Roebuck, Lima, Peru, and threw it on the truck, and it got there. Yeah, they sold them all over there. That is amazing. Yeah, so thank y'all. I want to thank y'all very much. This is wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.